We've got about a minute until the closing bell, and we've got our panel here to help make sense of the market action. We're joined today by Francis Newton Stacey, Optimal Capital Director of Strategy, and Aaron Gibbs, Gibbs Wealth Management Portfolio Manager. And Aaron, I'll turn this first question over to you. We are seeing markets staging a bit of a rebound rally here on this final day of the week. What do you make of today's market action? I think you know we've we've been plagued by sort of negative sentiments and negative uh, headlines in particular all week. Uh, I think this was really uh, expected to a little bit of just a bit of a breather, a pause. Um, as as said before, it's August, it's low volume, so it's very easy for sentiment to sort of take over the trading range, trading sentiment in the day. Uh, so I, I see this as just a bit of a pause, but I don't see that we're just out of the woods just yet when it comes to some of the coronavirus concerns and economic recovery. Well, we want to get one final look here at the market before we close out today's trading session. Seeing markets trading higher across the board, the Dow up by more than 200 points or 0.6 percent. We have Microsoft leading the way higher in that index. Of course, that stock did hit a record high today. And as we take a look here at the market, we now have the closing. All right, give us the gavel. Come on. Oh, a showman there. All right, we got the day settled. We're going to close up, as Jared said, on the day, but down for the week. Dow's going to be up 224 points today. The S&P 500 up 35 points. NASDAQ up 172 points. All sectors in the green today. Some of the leaders on the Dow include Cisco Systems up roughly 2%. You had Home Depot up 2%. Microsoft up almost 3%. And Microsoft hitting a new intraday high. Let's go back to the panel and talk about this, especially when we talk about all-time highs. Because, Francis, you've pointed out that we've seen them softening as uh, we get ready to head into the fourth quarter. How severe do you think it's going to be? Well, as of right now, it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of a buy the dip scenario and episodic volatility. The volatility uh, peaking out at 25 did not take out the volatility at 25 in July or at 28 in May. Uh, so right now we have the buy the dip. But as you say, four out of the five factors that led us to all time highs, which is you know, acceleration in growth, acceleration in inflation, acceleration in corporate profits, uh, you know, re record fiscal stimulus, record monetary stimulus, those things driving us to all time highs are softening in the fourth quarter. How much that softening is really going to affect markets has a lot to do with what the, t the Fed is going to do, because that fifth thing is the holdout. And also it has to do with the health and credit markets as people return to, you know, p potentially having to pay rents if they don't qualify for COVID relief or you know, having to pay their mortgages. So the liquidity is gonna slowly start to be drained out of the system, and that's the liquidity that brought us to these all-time highs. There's still a lot in the system. So the rate at which that occurs is going to be reflected in the market movement and the volatility in the fourth quarter. Aaron, we just had Francis talking a bit about the Fed. What do you think the market is pricing in in terms of Jackson Hole next week? And what do you think might catalyze or be interpreted by the markets as something more hawkish or dovish than they're expecting? Well, I, I think we're, given that they communicate so frequently these days, I think the market is pricing, you know, some type of tightening on just more of the, the repurchase programs, I'm uh, sorry, more of the, the auctions uh, over, let's say, somewhere in the fourth quarter, starting in the fourth quarter, um, but certainly not raising rates. So, you know, it's just in the very first stages of pulling back on the liquidity, as we just talked about, and, and pulling back on some of that cash that's out there that, that, uh, with the treasury auction. So um, I think the, you know, the market's pretty transparent given the, the tenure um, just finally seems to be recovering from its lows. Uh, and uh, I, th I think the markets are really prepared to have you know, low interest rates for, for quite some period of time. Yeah, you know, given that, Francis, if markets are going to have low interest rates for a long period of time, we used to have discussions all the time about corporate debt loads and were there going to be problems with some of this debt that markets were taking on before the pandemic. Can we dismiss those discussions for the next two years? 
Well, I don't know. Again, when you have liquidity coming out of the system, you put pressure on debt service. And so, again, it just depends on to what degree. Uh, as far as uh, yields, the 10-year, interestingly, uh, reacted to the slowing in growth more than it reacted to the taper conversation around Friday's minutes. Uh, you know, it was surprising to see a dip in the 10-year because obviously a tapering conversation is going to put upward pressure on rates. So that remains to be seen. I agree with... Um, uh, your other guests that, you know, the tapering conversation, whether they stop buying assets, you know, in December, January, February, it's still a bit of a ways off. But even if that $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill goes through, even though that's a gigantic number, the rate at which that money is coming into the system is actually pretty dramatically slowed from, you know, the height of the COVID stimulus. And so, again, health of credit markets, ability to service debt, obviously keeping those interest rates low is key. The dollar moving lower. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can pay back debt with cheaper dollars. We've got a double top on the dollar at 93.75 from its March 31st high. So watching the dollar and watching the 10-year is going to give us some indication of what the Fed may do to ameliorate these two potential pressures to the record amount of debt service in the system. And Aaron, we're heading into a seasonally weaker period for stocks come September. Uh, given these typical seasonality trends, the additional risks around Delta, Fed policy changes, how would you suggest investors be positioned right now? Uh, so I'm strongly recommending really being focused on core. Uh, I think we could go either way with uh, you know, short-term outperformance of growth versus value. We've seen a bit of passing the baton in the, the past few weeks of August. Uh, and so I, I think one of the safest bet is to look at growth at a reasonable price, really being core, but being sensitive to valuation. So I'm generally avoiding investors to avoid the mega caps because that's um, really needs a lot of uh, generally more positive sentiment uh, to get them even on further higher valuations. And, and we know with uh, even today with some of the political headlines that that can pull back. Um, so being really selective uh, about what you get into or just being in the broad market index and not trying to play either the value or growth side. Um, uh, Aaron, the the people who've talked about the S&P 500 going to 5,000 by the end of the year, there are a lot of us who have the fear of missing out. It's hard to dismiss that. And, you know, it's human nature. But it's kind of expensive right now to be jumping into these markets, even though this week we're going to be down. What would you advise a client who came to you with that kind of nervousness? Uh, I'd say, actually, when we're looking at valuations, though it is undoubtedly expensive, and right now the, the S&P 500 is trading at about 21 and a half times forward earnings, which is um, we haven't seen these kind of valuations since 2002. So it's almost a 20 year high. So, But the problem is that uh, analysts have been so dramatically underestimating what companies actually report. Um, and it's been this pattern for the past five quarters that if you take out, if you adjust the earnings for uh, the type of underestimation that they've been showing us for the past year, um, it actually looks more like the market is trading at about 18 and a half times, which is at its top of the range for the past 10, 20 years, um, but still um, a reasonable valuation where you still should be going into it. So I'd say given the long term growth, uh, I don't think you can time the market much better than you can you know, waiting for a bigger dip or certain lower uh a point is, is unlikely and you should invest, you should be invested as the U.S. economy does look to be one of the strongest, at least for the next 12 months. All right, Francis Newton Stacy, Optimal Capital Director of Strategy and Aaron Gibbs, Gibbs Wealth Management Portfolio Manager. Thank you both for joining us today.